it's really amazing to be speaking in, in, uh, in the middle of a, of a string of such an august crowd, and it's really remarkable to be speaking in front of a, an audience like this. The, just bear with me a sec. The theme for the topic, the theme for today, is reimagining citizenship in the 21st century. And specifically what I want to talk about is growing new citizens, the next generation of citizens, through an activity which some people might think is quaint and old-fashioned, but which I think is very helpful and very useful and very important, and that is debating. And I'm going to talk about, uh, hopefully I'm going to answer three questions. And the three questions are, what kind of citizens are we looking for? What is the environment that we're working within and what are the impediments that it, that it presents to us? And given that, how do we grow the next generation of citizens? And I'm going to try and answer these three questions by putting them in context of what I've seen over time. And I can't claim to be ancient, and I certainly can't claim any kind of wisdom, but you, know, you can't go this far without having to you know, be, been beat up a little bit and picked up a few things. So I'm, I'm going to provide you with them. Uh, the first constant, there have been three constants in my life all the way through, and they've been referenced by the, by the uh, person who introduced me. And the first one is politics and public service. I've been a very close observer of public environment, public policy, uh, public processes, partially because I have to be. Uh, because of the jobs that I've held, my job has been to try and advise powers that be, be they politicians or be they uh, bureaucrats, to try and either keep up with public environment or ideally try and stay ahead of the public environment. And it's been really fascinating being at the nexus of politicians, interest groups, bureaucrats, and citizens, because after a while you get to see a remarkable thing. You get to see what, be, what is effective citizenship and what is people just spinning their wheels. And there's a very big difference there between effective citizenship, one that has an effect and an impact on society, and people who are, frankly, just complaining. Because just complaining is not enough. You actually have to do something. This is an example of probably some of the most effective citizenship, I think, of the 20th century. Uh, the US uh, civil rights movement had an amazing impact, not just in the United States, but also the world. So what kind of citizens are we looking for? Now, fortunately, that area has already been well-defined and well-discussed by speakers ahead of me, so I don't need to spend too much time on that. But the one thing I will say, and the one idea I will leave you with, is that ideally, citizens take an ownership stake in the world around them. They take an ownership stake in their neighborhood, in their city, in their province, in their state, in their country, in the world, in the future. They look at the world and they say, it belongs to me. I want to take care of it. I want to shape its future. I want to do something about it. That, I believe, is effective citizenship. Now, it used to be, once upon a time, that the way we measured citizenship was by voting. And it was a really simple metric. If you voted, you were a good citizen. If you didn't vote, you were a bad citizen. But that doesn't work anymore. If we go across the globe, we look at this province, we look at this country, we look across North America and the Western world, one thing we see is that with virtually every election we hold, the rate of people going out and voting is going down. It's down in Newfoundland, it's down in Canada, it's down in the US, it's down across most of the Western world. So clearly, that is not the right metric to use anymore. I'm not sure it ever really was, but you know, there you go. So we're going to have to look at other ways of looking at citizenship besides simple voting. Now, the other constant that's been in my life is information technology in the wired world. Now, my, I started university in the early 80s, in 1980, and I started off as a computer science major. Nobody recognized one of these anymore. The very se first semester I did computer science at Mont was the last semester they used punch cards. Thank God after that they tossed them all away. But the, since then, and I've been deeply involved in computers since then, although I got out of the computer science area because I didn't want to spend all my time looking down at the innards of computers, I preferred to look up and look at the wider world. But the things I've seen have been very remarkable in the way they've changed the world. I've seen how computers and information technology has changed the way we work. It's changed the way we think. 
It's changed the way we interact with each other, and therefore, it has changed the world. But most importantly, I wanna, and I want to talk about is the way it changes the way we think, but I'll get to that in a few minutes. One huge difference with the wired world information technology is just a vast quantity of information that's available to us. I mean, we have literally billions of web pages. This is something that I took out uh, just the other day. As of Friday, there were 7.24 billion web pages indexed. That's a pretty remarkable thing. How do we absorb that kind of information when there's just so much of it out there? Well, Google is one way we do it these days. The other day, I wanted to find out what is the coastline distance, the length of the coastline of the island of Newfoundland. And so I did what everybody does, I did a Google search. But unlike most Google searches that I'm normally used to, what it did was it gave me a best guess. It gave me, in its opinion, in its considered analysis, <laughs> what the information was. I no longer have to go through pages upon pages to find the information. Google tells me that for me. Now, Google is very upfront. They want to produce the world's largest artificial intelligence, and they're well on their way to doing it. So what kind of effect does that have on the way we absorb information when the Internet will tell us what we want right off the bat? Well, there's a report that came out recently by a group called Pew Internet Elon, Elon University who surveyed 1,000 uh, information technology stakeholders, uh, people who own companies, people who are developers, people who are critics, all different kinds. And they talk about something called Gen AO. Now, Gen AO is the generation of people who were born in, the, in 1990 to today. Their question was, how will these people manage themselves and manage the future and manage society in the year 2020. Gen AO stands for Gen Always On. They are always plugged in. They're the ones with the smartphones. They're the ones with the iPads. They're the ones with the laptops. They're the ones that are always on. Now, I have two children. Uh, my son, Simon, was born in 1992. And my daughter, Diana, was born in 1993. Hi, sorry you couldn't make it here today. Uh, and they're both part of this cohort. So I've got a, a, a sort of a deep familiarity with this crowd. But the really interesting thing is a lot of the experts that they talk about talk about the fact that we no, no longer need to be memorizing anymore. And in fact, what we need to do is just forget memorization of retention of information. What we want to focus on is thinking. Internet has freed us from learning, they say, so that we are free to think. But the fascinating thing is that while we're doing that, while we're doing the uh, thinking part, the big question becomes, well, what are we supposed to think about since we don't have the information, the raw material to work from? And this is happening more and more. And we see some really profound changes. We see that attention spans are getting shorter. We see that patience is it's, it's shot. We see that time speeds up. We are rapidly reaching the point of an ADD society. Experts talk about fast twitch wiring the brain, which comes from super fast, super short communications. Tweets are 140 characters. Text messages are only 160. We read differently than we used to. It used to be once upon a time. Actually, okay, I'll, I'll, let me jump ahead a little bit. Take two children born in history. Let's take a child that was born 3,500 years ago in Egypt. And let's take a child who was born today in New York City. Assuming that the mothers have equal access to good food, what is the difference between those two children and what do they have in common? Well, in fact, they have absolutely everything in common. For one very simple reason, they both have the same brain. They are both born with roughly 85 to 100, million, 100 billion neurons, and they have the capacity to create in excess of 100 trillion synapses. Synapses are the connections between the neurons. It is that structure that provides our personality, our thinking, our uh, learning, all of that stuff is a function of, of our synapses. So here's the problem, that while the internet has relieved us of the tedium of information, it has not taught us how to think, and I don't believe it ever, it ever will. See, the thing about critical thinking is that critical thinking is the, in a practical sense, is a combination of uh, information and uh, reasoning. 
it logical forms. And if we don't have that, then, well, you know, we're not really doing, going into critical thinking at all. We are not just how we read, we are what we read. Now, the third constant in my life has been debating. Debating is very simple. Debating is just about, it's just a structured argument. Any kind of topic will do, because the topic is irrelevant. It doesn't matter what you're debating. It's a test of ideas, which determines whether or not a debate, is, a debate occurs. By testing those ideas, that's where things become strong. And the difference between debating and virtually every other activity in school, in our system, is clash. That clash of ideas is what determines uh, is, is the debating part. And we'll give you five quick reasons for why we should be doing it a whole lot more. By the way, what's this time we're doing? It's jumping ahead very fast? No? Yes? I don't know. Uh, the first reason why we, we don't do it in schools, and we need to start, and we need to do it a whole lot more. And the first reason is because it improves critical thinking. The ability to take for a student, for anybody, to take an idea, put it in their heads, and twist it around, and turn it inside out, and look at the other side, regardless of their beliefs on the subject, is an extremely valuable skill, and we don't have enough of that. Debating teaches us how to do research. It provides the tools to find information, and it also provides the motivation to find information, because information is the raw material for thinking. If we don't have information, then we can't possibly think. It improves the ability to listen critically, and that's an important thing, because that's something we're not very good at either, because people think, about, people think that debating is all about talking, but it's not. If you have four people, uh, two teams against two teams, then 25% of their time is spent talking, but 75% of their time is spent in critical listening. They're listening to the other side, trying to figure out what they're saying and how they're going to respond to it. They're listening to their partner and trying to figure out what he or she is saying so that they can either back it up or buttress or you know, whatever they plan to do with it. It teaches how to communicate confidently and effectively. Now, one thing I should tell you is it's really interesting how debating works because, uh, like, I've been doing it for a long time, I've been coaching it for a long time, and girls, I'm going to talk about girls just for a second because we tried to ch chat about feminism. Girls dominate debating at junior high level. They get, they, 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 their numbers, proportions starts to diminish at the high school level, and it really sends out at the university level. If we want to really empower girls in our society to stand up for themselves, we need to teach them this. We need to teach them debating because they become confident, they become strong, and they have no problem saying what they need to say. If you go, and, and just in general, if you go to a high school or you go to a junior high school these days, oh my, they're, off, they're awfully close to speaking a different language, aren't they? <laughs> Do we really understand what they're saying? And you know, and I've read, I've read the reports. I've read the reports that say that, you know, junior highs and senior highs are experimenting with language and they're producing their own kind of, you know, that, uh, that's understood among themselves. And that's all great and wonderful, except for one little tiny thing. While they are developing and speaking their own language, the side effect of that is that they take themselves out of the wider society. They take themselves out of, what is ser what, of, of, of the general population. Citizens need to be part of the general population. They should be able to communicate in a way which is understood by everybody else. They need to find common ways of saying what needs to be said. And that won't happen if they speak their own language. Finally, debating is fun. Not only fun, there's a couple of years ago, I was coaching at a school in town, and we were heading into a competition. It wasn't very long ahead. And the students wanted to have more, more practice time. Sure, I said, you want more practice time? You give me a call. Anytime you have four students in a room, and I'll be there. We'll do a round. Well, I'm starting to get calls at 8, 10 o'clock at night telling me to go into their high school at 7 o'clock in the morning, where they're going to be. So I go to the high school, 7 o'clock in the morning, bang on the door, get somebody to let me in, go to the classroom they told me to be at, and there's four high school students. And we do, an, we do a debating round. And then I give them a debrief, I go to work, they go to their classes. These are high school students. They're in school at 7 o'clock in the morning. If that's not an addiction, I'm not sure what is. You're looking at me very funny. I will absolutely wrap it up. Uh, I'm going to finish off with one basic idea very quickly, and that is this one. In 1965, a writer by the name of Theodore Sturgeon wrote an article in a magazine called Cavalier, and what he talked about was this, 
which was ask the next question. It is probably the most important concept that I can leave you with. Ask the next question. He talked about the man in the cave, the man in the cave who looked out and said, hmm, I wonder if man can fly. Next question. Where would we go if we could fly? Next question. How are we going to fly? Next question. Can I put people together so that we can fly? Eventually getting to the question of, hmm, how much can I charge people for flying? <laughs> but the most important thing that we can ever do is, continue, is never be satisfied with the information that we have. It's always to ask the next question. Thank you very much.